A black van with tinted windows is parked in front of an Art Nouveau building not far from Munich's English Garden. It's September. The COVID-19 vaccine drive is in full swing, with countries around the world debating just who should get booster shots. Inside the Munich Villa's heavy door is a narrow entry foyer that leads up a wooden staircase. There's a cluster of people coming down. It's Germany's star scientists, Ötzlem Turaci and Ur Shahin. They're the husband and wife duo behind BioNTech, Pfizer's partner for the COVID vaccine. And they're on their way out of a meeting with the company's chairman, Helmut Jegle. Ötzlem and Ugor say hello politely and then head out the door. Helmut is waiting upstairs to talk to me about BioNTech and its race to develop a messenger RNA vaccine. Helmut laughs when I ask what they talked about that day. Next generation mRNA treatments are on everyone's mind. <laughs> Next generation? Next generation? No. Of course, we have to think about how we develop the company because of the situation we are in now. Helmut has known the BioNTech founders since 2007. He was working then for the Strungman brothers, the German billionaires who helped fund the company. He's been involved with BioNTech since the beginning and chairman of the board since 2008. When we talked, it had been almost a year since Helmut, Uhor, and Utzlem found out that the bet on BioNTech and on messenger RNA technology had paid off in the biggest possible way. Helmut compares it to a moon landing. You plan and you work and you prepare, and it's all theoretical until you step out the door of your spacecraft, and suddenly, you're there. It's almost hard to believe that you've actually made it. He tells me that after he heard the news from Ugor about how well the vaccine worked in a patient trial, he left his phone at home and went out for a walk. He lives out in the country, and it was a peaceful night. He says he figured it would be his last quiet night for a while. That's exactly why I want to enjoy this moment quietly by myself. Helmut turned out to be right. The vaccine isn't just one of humankind's best weapons so far against the COVID pandemic. It's also the vindication for an entirely new field of medicine. Suddenly, Messenger RNA vaccines are the world's best-selling drugs. And suddenly, the young biotechs that developed them, Germany's BioNTech and Moderna from the U.S., are among the world's most closely scrutinized drug makers. Everybody wants to know what their next step will be. Welcome to the eighth episode of our series. This time, we're looking at what's next for the biggest scientific breakthrough to emerge out of the COVID pandemic messenger RNA vaccines. Up until last year, it wasn't even clear they'd work at all. Now, everyone from hospitals and drug makers to Wall Street are waiting to see where else they can be used and what the payoff could be for patients and for the companies. The technology could help engineer a better flu shot, for example, but its potential goes far beyond zapping viruses. Messenger RNA is being tested in cancer medicines and in heart disease. Some researchers are also studying whether it could be useful against autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, or even treat genetic illnesses like sickle cell anemia. Some argue that we can't even imagine how widely this technology will eventually be used, and that eventually there won't even be such a thing as an mRNA vaccine company. That the technology will become so widespread that it's just another piece of the puzzle for drug makers working in all sorts of fields. My name is Naomi Kresge, and I'm a health reporter for Bloomberg News. From the Prognosis Podcast, this is Breakthrough. That's the sound of equipment at BioNTech's headquarters in Mainz, Germany. It's about a half hour drive west of the Frankfurt airport. Okay, what you see here inside these rooms, 
the lab and infrastructure director, Francois Perino, is showing me around. I've been at BioNTech's offices before in late 2018, and I'm struck by what has changed and what has stayed the same. Now they have a fence and a security officer who takes his time letting me in. But the building itself doesn't look any fancier than it did before. Most pharma headquarters that I've visited have a certain glossy veneer. There tends to be a lot of modern art, soaring atriums, and high-tech elevators. Not BioNTech. We mostly take the stairs, which is okay, because the building's only a couple stories tall. The labs are on the same floor as the CEO's office. They've been adding research space and equipment, though. So this is a kind of workbench where all the sterile processes are performed. So kind of the whole facility is called cell culture facility. And within this facility, we do all our experiments with cells, cells from human, for example. When Francois joined BioNTech in 2016, about 550 people worked at the mine's headquarters. Now it's about three times as many. And most of the development of the COVAC or Cominati vaccine was performed inside these facilities over here. The whole cell culture facility is approximately about 400 square meters. And it's just about cell culturing. We're there in the late afternoon, so the labs have emptied out quite a bit. A few scientists linger, taking advantage of the quiet to finish projects. Some of the people we meet are working on research that's still far from being ready to be tested in patients. The mine's facility also makes mRNA for use in research and development. BioNTech is pouring its COVID vaccine profits into its pipeline of new experimental medicines. Company scientists are working on some infectious disease projects, including vaccines for malaria, HIV, and tuberculosis. None of those are far enough along to be tested in humans, though. The more advanced part of the pipeline is almost entirely potential cancer treatments. The company's running 19 patient trials in cancer. About half of these are mRNA vaccines. In fact, before the COVID pandemic, BioNTech was basically a cancer company. As we learned in last week's episode, it didn't work on infectious disease vaccines until mid-2018 when it signed a deal with Pfizer to develop a flu shot. But it's already treated about 600 patients in cancer trials. Most were small studies, designed to look at safety. That's how drug development works. First, you test a potential medicine in only a few people, and if it's shown to be safe, you can move on to testing its efficacy in a bigger group. You might see some hints of an impact against disease in phase one, but that's not really what those trials are designed to find out. But thanks to the COVID vaccine cash, BioNTech has been able to move quickly on the bigger studies it'll need to push its cancer programs forward. One of those programs is called iNest. Essentially, it's a personalized mRNA cancer vaccine. We're standing in front of a washing machine-sized piece of equipment in one of the labs. It's crucial to the project. And this machine is, uh, yeah, is very important. It's very important for us because this is one of, let's say, kind of the heart for our analysis for the INIST uh, treatment. In order to make a personalized cancer vaccine, BioNTech has to sequence the genetic code of each patient's tumor. The researchers use this machine to do the sequencing. For, so every, 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 the, the tumor is caused by different mutations inside the genome. And we have to have a look at the whole genome to be sure that we, that we find or that we, that we identify the mutations and that we know how to shape the mRNA. The computer algorithm helps them find the special pattern of mutations that's unique to the tumor, not found elsewhere in the body. Then BioNTech's teams can take that pattern and build a template for an mRNA treatment. Remember how the mRNA vaccine for COVID works. It delivers instructions for cells to make the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. That jolts the immune system into action. So if it encounters the real virus, it can act quickly to stop it. The mRNA cancer vaccine would train the body's immune system too, but to attack a tumor, not a virus. It's a treatment. 
not a preventative measure. And the mRNA is, let's say, the, the needed trigger for your immune system. BioNTech already has some promising results with INEST in a small trial with just 13 patients. It's now testing the technology in bigger studies in melanoma and colorectal cancer. Like for the COVID vaccine, they're working with an experienced partner. It's one of the biggest cancer drug makers in the world, a Swiss company called Roche Holding. You may have heard of Roche's U.S. unit called Genentech. I wanted to get Roche's view on mRNA cancer vaccines, so I called Charlie Fuchs, who runs their oncology and hematology product development. He's the former director of Yale Cancer Center, and as an oncologist, he helped run huge clinical trials for other successful cancer immunotherapies. Charlie says the COVID vaccine's success is a good sign for the likelihood of mRNA technology working for cancer, too. Seeing that on a population level and seeing the validation in patients that this technology really does enable robust immune responses, I think is an important step in believing that we can leverage this technology for cancer. Still, just because mRNA vaccines worked against COVID doesn't mean they'll stop tumors. You know, viruses are tiny little packages of limited genetic code that uh, can create havoc by interfering with functions, the normal functions of a human cell, or for that matter, creating an immune response that's harmful. But, um, but they're very limited. Cancers are a lot more complex. They're a lot better at defending themselves. Cancers are human cells that have mutated to leverage the full extent of the machinery and genetic code of a complex human cell such that it will um, become malignant spread. And because it has so the availability of the entire human genome w associated with it, that it can actually come up with lots of different mechanisms to overcome response to cancer therapy, to sustain itself, to avoid the immune surveillance. This is one reason that doctors often combine cancer therapies. And it's one reason, unfortunately, that cancer treatments sometimes stop helping after a few months or years. And so there's just a lot more to deal with when you're developing a cancer therapy as opposed to a virus, which is a tiny little compartment a very limited genetic code, very limited DNA or RNA. Charlie tells me he thinks they'll have a better sense of how well mRNA vaccines can help with cancer treatment within the next two years. I'm thinking about Charlie's words when I talk with BioNTech Chief Medical Officer Utslem Turechi a few weeks later. She and her husband, Uwar Shahin, the CEO, are also oncologists. They treated patients for years before they started BioNTech. Uh, we spent most of our time uh, uh, at the pa patient's bedside. That was the motivation, uh, to provide better medicines for those patients whom we had to tell that uh, we had nothing to offer them. Erzlem agrees that cancer is a tougher target than COVID. For the immune system, SARS-CoV-2 is foreign. Cancer is part of us. So it's not about, uh, about uh, preventing, it's about uh, melting away uh, a substantial tumor burden. Uh, so there are already immune suppressive mechanisms where cancer has uh, installed and uh, you have to, to fight against them and fight against immune tolerance because it's not really a foreign protein which you are using as target. And um, so this is a very different, higher challenge. All those years working to optimize mRNA technology for cancer vaccines helped when it came time to make the COVID shot. Uh, I think uh, the reason why we have been successful in COVID-19 is that we have sharpened our weapons against cancer uh, uh, with all those um, uh, yeah, higher thresholds for, for success. And once they'd optimized mRNA for cancer, 
Ertzlem tells me they started realizing there would be potential in lots of other diseases too. They want to develop mRNA treatments for autoimmune diseases, illnesses in which the body attacks itself. Multiple sclerosis is one example. For a disease like MS, an mRNA vaccine would work in the opposite way to how it's used against cancer or COVID. Ertzlem explains. We have shown that um, uh, while for cancer or infectious disease vaccines, the mRNA is used to deliver two signals uh, or messages, namely on the one hand to present the target, for example, the COVID-19 spike protein or a tumor antigen, plus to provide um, the message that the immune system needs to attack in particular, that the CD8 killer T cells need to be di directed against uh, this, this target. For autoimmune diseases, the mRNA vaccine would still wave a flag for the immune system to recognize something. But the second message we deliver is that the immune system, once it sees this target, needs to calm down and needs to accept this target and not attack. So it's telling the body to stop turning against itself. BioNTech has had a successful experiment in this area with mice, but they're still quite a ways away from having an mRNA vaccine to test in people with autoimmune diseases. Moderna, the other mRNA COVID vaccine maker, is also working on an autoimmune disease project. Moderna is also working on mRNA-based cancer vaccines and a cystic fibrosis treatment, as well as a treatment for heart disease, and it has a broad palette of other potential mRNA vaccines for infectious diseases, everything from Zika and flu to HIV. I caught up with one of the early investors in BioNTech, a German venture capitalist named Matthias Kromeyer, at a conference in Berlin to find out more about the broader field. You need to keep in mind that mRNA is at the, the center of any biological process. I mean, any gene that gets expressed is expressed via mRNA. Matthias's firm, MIG Capital, gave BioNTech about $15 million in seed money in 2008. It was MIG's best investment ever. Now he says the approach could be useful in any kind of genetic disorder where the body doesn't make something that it should from diabetes to hemophilia or rare diseases. But the first chance to see the proof of the pudding will be the cancer trials. Oncology. It, it's definitely oncology because this is where the companies are most advanced. So I would expect first approvals, um, provided that these, these uh, studies work out nicely, first approvals in 24 or 25. That's a lot longer than it took to get the COVID vaccines approved. But in drug development terms, it's actually pretty fast. It just takes longer to see whether an experimental treatment can help cancer patients than it does to see whether a vaccine can stop a virus from making people sick. First of all, you can't recruit 20,000 cancer patients in a, in a couple of weeks' time. Secondly, the endpoint in, in, in the COVID-19 um, COVID um, immunized, immunized population, it took only weeks to reach the endpoint um, of a, a number of events in oncology. It's usually years that you need to wait until people have survived or not. So this is why it takes longer. It's not because people weren't working as diligently as in the COVID-19 vaccination area. If you talk to some of the early pioneers in mRNA, the sky is the limit for what else the technology could do. Remember Derek Rossi, the Harvard stem cell scientist who did important early experiments with mRNA and founded Moderna? He says his original vision for the company wasn't vaccines at all. Vaccines have been in production for, you know, you know, 100 years and they work. Uh, and uh, so why reinvent the wheel? Uh, well, there is, turns out, as we now know, there is good reasons for that. It's a faster technology. It's a more precise technology. It's a better technology for vaccination. It's true. But what I imagined was uh, application towards genetic disease. Derek tells me there are 6,000 genetic diseases. He says that's 6,000 mutations in DNA, 
which lead to bad mRNA, which lead to a problem with a protein, which leads to disease. Derek's idea was to use mRNA vaccines to spur cells to make the right proteins instead. Wherever protein is needed, it can be applied. So um, that could be 6,000 genetic diseases, uh, oncology, cancer, mutated genes. Projects to study how mRNA therapy can be used to treat genetic disease are also in the works. In fact, Drew Weissman, the University of Pennsylvania professor who worked with Catalin Carrico to answer vital early questions around mRNA research, is now working on an mRNA vaccine for sickle cell anemia, one of the most common genetic disorders. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation is sponsoring the research. Drew tells me some 200,000 people are born every year with sickle cell disease, most of them in sub-Saharan Africa. There's a cure, but it's way too expensive for a lot of these patients. And what they do is they take a patient, they take out a lot of bone marrow, they infect the bone marrow with a lentivirus, and then they give it back. That's probably a half a million dollar per person cost uh, for, for a sickle cell cure. You can't do 200,000 bone marrow biopsies in sub-Saharan Africa. So Drew's lab has figured out how to target bone marrow stem cells with an mRNA treatment. It inserts a new gene into the genome of the stem cells. Instead of removing a patient's bone marrow, doctors would simply need to give them an IV injection. To me, that, that changes the world because now you can do gene therapy with a simple injection. We should make this clear. This program isn't in human trials yet. It's being tested now in mice. As Drew has told us several times, success in mice doesn't necessarily translate to humans. Drew's lab has a laundry list of other projects as well. He's working with BioNTech on a range of infectious disease vaccines. And he's working on a pan-coronavirus vaccine with Duke University, the University of North Carolina, and the National Institutes of Health. That's a shot that could work against all types of coronaviruses, not just SARS-CoV-2. The idea would be to have a vaccine that could cover whatever variant pops up in the future, maybe even something that's ready to go for the next pandemic. And they're working on an mRNA vaccine against HIV. If it succeeds, that would be transformative too. HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, has eluded vaccine efforts for decades. It, it mutates so quickly. The, the way it infects cells is very different. It forms a long-lived latent reservoir that's hard to get rid of. Um, it, and it has so many ways of avoiding immune responses. Again, the HIV vaccine is a long way from completion. Drew's team is also working with Duke and NIH on this project. He says it's due to start human trials next year. HIV is a much more difficult virus, so th that's going to take a lot more work to, to get it to work correctly. None of these new mRNA vaccines and treatments will have the same speedy trajectory as the COVID vaccine last year. That's partly because the circumstances are so different. As we saw in last week's episode, the pandemic was in some ways the perfect use case for mRNA vaccines. The vaccine makers could draw on years of prior work from virologists on what would be the best bit of a coronavirus to use for a vaccine. They could run relatively quick patient trials. With COVID circulating around the globe, there was no shortage of scope for testing the vaccine. And the SARS-CoV-2 virus is a lot more straightforward than cancer or HIV. Now the companies that raced to get COVID vaccines on the market are going to need to start playing a more complicated game. They'll need to reassure investors that their billions in revenues won't just be a one-off. They're grappling with a tremendous pace of growth. Moderna, in particular, has struggled to set up a global distribution network without a big partner like Pfizer. It recently said it wouldn't be able to ship as many COVID vaccine doses as expected this year. Meanwhile, 
Smaller startups around the world are also working on mRNA vaccines and treatments. When I ask Helmut Yegla, the BioNTech chairman, about the biggest challenges ahead, he says the company has to be careful to stay focused. We must be careful that we are... We just need to be careful that we don't go after too many things at once, and we really need to focus. Helmut says he thinks BioNTech will have more mRNA products on the market in a few years. It reminds me of the song by the Hungarian rock singer who appeared on that radio interview with Katalin Kariko, the pioneering mRNA researcher in Budapest. We played some of it in episode 6. The song's about how you need to work hard and stay the course to achieve your goals. The diamonds and gold have a nice shine, but you have to dig deep to get it. Catalin says her favorite part of the song is about what happens when you finally hit your target. The lyrics, roughly translated from Hungarian, are But when you reach your goal, and could be happy, you're already thinking about a new plan, already embarking on a new road, And that's the beauty of life. BioNTech, Moderna, and their competitors have new plans too. And it's all about mRNA. Next week on Breakthrough, we'll talk with the public health leaders and scientists who are preparing for the next pandemic, even before this one is over. COVID has shown us how vulnerable our health systems really are. Will we be ready when the next pandemic comes? They are a very modern threat that emerges from the way we have organized our societies, and they represent a critical threat for the 21st century. This episode of Prognosis Breakthrough was written and reported by me, Naomi Kresge. Topher Forges and Magnus Henriksen are our senior producers. Carl Kevin Robinson Jr. is our associate producer. Our theme music was composed and performed by Hannes Brown. Philip Korn did voiceover, and Bob Langreth and Zoltan Shimon contributed reporting. Rick Schein is our editor. Francesca Levy is the head of Bloomberg Podcasts. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like this episode, please leave us a review. It helps others find out about the show. Thanks for listening. 